at it. Um, thanks, Carl. I'm glad to be here. I'm uh, Montana is probably my second. What's, what's I do need you to use the mic. Please. Need to use the mic. All right. Montana is probably my second favorite state after Oregon. Uh, I spent a lot of time here wandering around the wilderness areas and uh, uh, looking at the parks and so on and so forth. I've looked at all the national forests in Montana and recently have been looking at transportation and private land issues here. Now, uh, I start out looking at uh, uh, property rights and, and land use planning uh, by looking at what planners in the United States are proposing. And the interesting thing is what we're hearing people talk about today is not very different from what people were talking about 40 years ago. Uh, 45 years ago, some planners at the University of Moscow wrote a book called The Ideal Communist City. This book was supposed to define how cities in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe would be built over the next 50 years. And they said in order to prevent the kind of urban sprawl that we see in the United States, that everybody should be housed in high-rise apartments. And that in order to prevent the kind of con traffic congestion that we see in the United States, everybody should travel around on uh, urban transit, uh, metros or, or trolleys, trams, whatever. And that this kind of a uh, high-density housing projects would lead to a greater sense of community. And over the next 25 years, after that book was written, all kinds of high-rises were built throughout uh, Russia and Eastern Europe. And although, while I'm talking about this in terms of the uh, communist plans, they weren't really communist plans. And in fact, I'm not impugning the integrity of urban planners when I associate them with communists. The reality is that I'm... The reality is that I'm impugning the integrity of communists when I associate them with urban planners. <laughs> because communism might have worked if they hadn't turned their economy over to planners. The reality is it wasn't just Eastern Europe and Russia that were doing these high-density developments. These are, this is a development in, in Western Germany. This is a development in, in Switzerland. I was recently in Korea. Uh, it seems like half the people in Korea, even in small towns, are housed in high-density developments like this. In the United States, we decided to build such developments only for low-income people. This is a development, that, an award-winning development that was built by the architect who later designed the World Trade Center. And it met the same fate as the World Trade Center. It proved to be so unlivable that after just 17 years, it was blown up. Uh, people refused to live in it because it had such high crime. It, even if uh, the rent was free, nobody would live in it. Uh, in the 1970s, throughout Western Europe, uh, people uh, revolted against the idea that they should all be penned up in high-density housing. And instead, uh, the countries finally allowed people to build what we call sprawl, uh, single-family homes. And today, most Western Europeans and most most of the countries now live in single-family homes or at most duplexes in what we would consider to be a suburban environment. Uh, meanwhile, there are still high-density developments in those countries, and those are mainly occupants, occupied by immigrants, not by local residents, uh, often Muslim immigrants. And so we have these uh, 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 ghettos, essentially, of high-density high-rises with Muslim immigrants. And a couple of years ago, there were huge riots in in France uh, that were uh, in these ghettos uh, caused by the kind of discrimination that's forcing some people into this kind of housing. Now, today urban planners say we don't believe in high-rise housing, we believe in mid-rise dense housing. <laughs> and yet, uh, during the Olympics, I heard many commentators say, quoting urban planners, that Vancouver, British Columbia was one of the most livable cities in the world. And it has all kinds of high-rise condos. And in fact, they have neighborhoods of single-family homes that have been rezoned for high-rise condos. So people's next-door houses might get torn down, and then a high-rise condo will built, be built right next door to you. The same kind of thing is happening in my uh, former hometown of Portland, Oregon, which is also regarded as uh, a very livable city by whatever definition they have for livable. 
and it's become a mecca for urban planners. We see city officials, reporters, and urban planners from all over the United States and other countries fly into Portland and learn how it's done. So I'm going to tell you how they did it in Portland. First, they drew an urban growth boundary around the city. Uh, the urban growth boundary actually included 23 other cities and, and unincorporated parts of three counties. And outside the boundary, in fact, every city in Oregon has a boundary. Outside the boundary, you are not allowed to build a house on your own land unless you own at least 80 acres of land, you actually farm it, and you actually earned forty to $80,000 a year, depending on soil productivity, farming it in two of the last three years. That means and the planners are proud to report that only about 100 homes a year, a year are built outside of urban growth boundaries in Oregon. Now, inside the urban growth boundary, when they first drew the boundary in the 1970s, they said, well, when it gets filled up, we'll expand it. So there'll always be room to grow. But in fact, uh, since then, it's gotten full, filled up, land prices have shot up, and they only really had one expansion, and the planners have thrown so many obstacles in front of developers to develop in this area called Damascus that uh, uh, nothing has happened there. Instead, they decided instead of expanding it, they would densify it. They would rezone neighborhoods inside the boundary to higher densities. And they used minimum density zoning. If uh, uh, your neighbor has a, a large yard and they rent out the house in front, well, they might just decide to put a, some apartments in the backyard. If your house burns down, you are not allowed to rebuild it. You're required to replace it with row houses or apartments or whatever it is that meets the minimum density of the zone. Now, most Americans say they want to live in single-family homes. About 85% of Americans say they aspire to live in a single-family home with a yard. And it's the, the goal of urban planners to drive down the percentage of people living in single-family homes because they drive too much and they waste land with their large yards, and to drive up the percentage of people living in apartments. So what you get is a surplus of apartments and a shortage of single-family homes. And that uh, really changes the housing market. For example, here's a two, four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath, 2,300-square-foot home in Houston that sold at the height of the housing bubble for $160,000. Now, that probably doesn't sound particularly amazing, looking at it uh, in most of Montana, that's probably what a house like that would sell for here, except in Missoula and the Flathead County, uh, maybe Bozeman. But, uh, but in, in Portland, that house actually got up to $380,000. Now it's down to $320,000 with the, with the popping of the bubble. Uh, in, in many other cities that have done this kind of planning in, in uh, uh, Boulder, Colorado, for example, would be about $640,000. In California cities, it would be up to $1.5 million for that same house. So planners have deliberately created a shortage of single-family housing, driving up the price in order to force people to live in multifamily homes. So what does that do to your neighborhoods? Well, here's a neighborhood in, in northeast Portland near where I grew up, and this is a, a house built on a quarter-acre lot. It's now feasible for developers to go in and tear down this house and then subdivide the lot and build four skinny houses, 15-foot wide houses. Uh, my father says it's, you know, there's a 12-foot wide garage and then a 3-foot wide front door. My father says it's a good thing that there's a back door because there's no room to turn around once you get inside. Now, they held a big design competition to uh, show, uh, to get different designs for skinny houses, and yet they almost all end up looking the same. Now, here's a place uh, nearby that, those four houses where some people built their houses too far apart. What a waste of land. Let's just chop down those trees and build ourselves a nice little skinny house. <laughs> Now, there, there are some differences from skin, between skinny houses, like this is a two-story skinny house, and then I found a three-story skinny house. <laughs> now, planners have decided 
the skinny houses aren't dense enough, row houses aren't dense enough. They really want multi-story apartment buildings, not high-rise, what they call mid-rise, that's four to five-story apartment buildings. And they really want to have uh, mixed-use buildings with uh, uh, shops on the ground floor and apartments upstairs. And here's a typical one in Portland. Oh, excuse me, that's not Portland, that's actually in the former East Germany, that's one of the ones built according to the, the precepts of the ideal communist city. Here's the one in Portland. <laughs> the difference is when I took this picture in 2005 in, in Halle Neustadt, Germany, this building was slated for destruction, for demolition, because all the people living in it had moved out to single family homes like this one. Whereas in Portland, planners have driven up the cost of single family housing so people have to live in housing like this. And by the way, this is supposed to be a mixed-use development with shops, coffee shops and stores and stuff like that, but they're all vacant because there's not enough, there's no parking for the retailers and there's not enough people living there within walking distance to drive the retail. Now Portland planning has become so intrusive that planners actually told this church that they would not be allowed to have more than 70 people worship at one time in its 400-seat sanctuary. Because letting more than 70 people in would mean that some people would have to drive and that would just cause too much traffic congestion. So I guess we're all just supposed to worship at the mosque or temple that's within walking distance of our homes. Now, if you think this can't happen in Montana, think again. Uh, Secretary of Immobility, uh, Ray LaHood, <laughs> has decreed that the next time every major urban area, that would include... Uh, Missoula and Billings, any urban area of 50,000 people or more, uh, does their transportation plan, and they're required by federal law to rewrite their transportation plan every five years, the next time they rewrite it, they're going to have to incorporate this kind of planning into their planning process. Uh, Missoula is ahead of the game. Missoula is already building high-density uh, uh, low-rise developments such as this one. I've seen high-density mid-rise developments in Montana uh, uh, and, and their goal is to get people out of their car. Now Barry promised you that I would talk about transit. I've been asked to talk about property rights so I wasn't going to include anything about transit but I threw in a couple of slides. Uh, the average American spends about 23 cents a passenger mile driving their car. And there are subsidies to highways. I think we should get rid of them. But there are subsidies that they add up to only about a penny a passenger mile. Compare that to the subsidies to transit in uh, Billings, Bozeman, Great Falls, and Missoula. Uh, you can see the green here shows the average fares that are paid. The bus in Bozeman is free, so there's no green. And then the red shows the subsidies, which are just huge, uh, more than $2 uh, in Missoula, almost $2.50 a passenger mile in Missoula. But of course, it's a good thing we're getting pe th those people out of their cars because it saves energy, right? Well, no, it turns out the average car uses about 3,300 BTUs a passenger mile. The average light truck, that's a pickup or SUV, uses a little over 4,000 BTUs a passenger mile, whereas transit uh, in Montana is using 6,000 to almost 9,000 BTUs a passenger mile. And I could have made a similar slide showing uh, pollution. Again, transit is emitting a lot more pollution, particularly nitro nitrogen oxides, which are a precursor of uh, ozone, and they're emitting a lot more uh, uh, CO2, if you think that's a pollutant. Some people think it's a pollutant. I'm not going to argue with them about that. I'm not a climatologist. I'm, a, I'm an economist. But what I'm really focusing on is planning and property rights. Urban planners believe that your property rights are subject to the whims of uh, current planning fads and, and what they th think the community is good for the community. Here's a book that's promoted by the American Planning Association. You can find it on their website. And the author of the book says that uh, private property uh, rights change over time as communities decide that they should change. So if, if you think you have a right to build a house on your land and the community changes its mind and suddenly you, you don't have a right to build on your, a house on your land. Like let's say your, your land 
right outside of a city, and the people living on the edge of the city say, your land is really provides them a wonderful scenic view, and it would just be too much of an imposition to them to have a house on your land. Well, they'll take away the right to uh, build a house, and they'll use something about, uh, oh, we need to stop sprawl, we need to save money, but really they're just trying to preserve scenic views. Now, this all goes back to a Supreme Court decision. The Cato Institute publishes a book called The Dirty Dozen, The Twelve Worst Supreme Court Decisions, and this goes to, back to one that was made in about 1976. It had to do with Grand Central Station in uh, New York City. Grand Central Station was actually designed to be a high-rise building with the station on the bottom and offices above. Uh, they never built the high-rise, but in the late 1960s, the Penn Central Railroad, which was near bankruptcy, decided, well, maybe we can make some money by using the air rights above our station and, and building a high-rise. We're not going to change the station. We're not going to change the interior or the exterior. All we're going to do is build a high-rise on top of the roof, just like we had originally planned to do. The city of New York said, no, that's a historic building. We want to take away from you the right to build that high-rise. And they took it to court, and the Supreme Court said, well, because New York City had written a comprehensive plan, well, that makes it okay to take people's property rights. If you've written a plan, you can take away people's property rights, is what the Supreme Court said. As I said, this was in the Dirty Dozen. Uh, the re more recent Kelo decision, which was made about uh, somebody's home in, in uh, uh, Connecticut, the Supreme Court said exactly the same thing. Uh, the city had written a plan, an economic development plan, and that plan showed it was better for this uh, Suzette Kilo's house to be torn down and given to a developer who had built a high-density housing development for, uh, uh, because uh, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals was planning to expand in, in uh, New London, Connecticut, and so they needed new housing. So that since they had written a plan, it was okay to tear down that house. So, of course, they tore down all those houses. Pfizer Pharmaceutical decided to build, expand somewhere else, and that land is now vacant. So uh, this actually came from a, an American Planning Association book. Good intentions are not enough. And yet somehow the Supreme Court and Congress and many legislators seem to believe uh, if, if the planners have good intentions, it doesn't matter what the result is. Uh, it will give them the right to take away people's property rights. Now, this has actually contributed to and, in fact, really uh, led to the housing crisis, which caused the economic uh, recession that we've been going through. Uh, the cities that had planning had housing bubbles. The cities that did not have planning, at least not the kind of planning I'm talking about, did not have housing bubbles. Now, uh, people have blamed the housing bubbles on the Federal Reserve Board, and uh, the, this is Alan Greenspan, and they blamed it on Congress, the Community, uh, uh, what was the Reinvestment Act, yeah. But if you look around the country, there are a lot of cities that had no housing bubbles. There's a Federal Reserve Board in Dallas, it had no housing bubble. Uh, there's a Community Reinvestment Act applied to Oklahoma City and Wichita, they had no housing bubbles. The cities that had housing bubbles are cities and states that had a certain kind of planning called growth management planning. Growth management planning are efforts to control where growth is going to take place or how fast it's going to take place. What's called smart growth is a special kind of growth management planning that focuses on making cities denser and more pedestrian, transit, and bicycle friendly so that people will drive less because somehow mobility, automobility is evil and getting people out of their cars is a good thing no matter what the cost. If you go to a city that has no planning, you'll find that the supply for housing is, is what economists call elastic. The supply curve is practically horizontal. No matter what the demand for housing is, that means the price is going to be the same. Houston has no zoning in the city, no zoning outside of the city. Uh, developers have a huge stock of land that they can build on. The land is instantly available. Uh, if, you can, if you go buy a piece of land, you can, from the day you close on the land until you get all your permits, get the contractors in, get your house built, and are ready to move in 90 to 120 days. 
in California, five years just to get the permits. And then once your house is built, you have to get more permits to be allowed to move in. So uh, there's a, essentially an unlimited supply of housing in Houston, and that's why they had no housing bubble. Now, Dallas and Fort Worth each have zoning, but the counties in Texas are not allowed to zone. So the city of Dallas says, well, if we want to zone for smart growth and nobody wants to live in smart growth, well, then the developers will just cross the city line and build whatever they want outside the city line and meet the demand for what people do want to live in. So the city knows that they can't force people to live in ways they don't want to live because they'll just go outside. So what you get in Texas typically are what are called master planned communities where thousands of acres of land are assembled by one developer. This is a development uh, I saw near Houston. Uh, the northern end, the red shows uh, high density housing. The orange is commercial and, and retail. Uh, the green is, of course, parks. And then most of the low density housing is down in the south end. Uh, probably, this is 13,000 acres, probably houses uh, 30,000 people. It's a beautiful development. If, if I had to live in Houston, which I, there's no mountains there, I'm a mountain guy, but if I had to live in Houston, I wouldn't mind living in a place like this. You can uh, buy houses there starting in the 160s. And I picked up a real estate guide that showed 24 other master plan communities in that county alone, and some of them had houses starting in the 110s. Uh, in Portland, you'll be lucky to get a new house starting in the three or four hundreds. Now, when you start doing growth management planning, you take that horizontal supply curve and tilt it upwards. You do what you, economists call it inelastic. That means a very small change in demand can lead to a large change in price. So, for example, this is uh, uh, San Jose. They have an urban growth boundary to the uh, west are other cities, but to the east and south, there's just bare land. They call it uh, steep land because it's hilly, although we're looking at flat land here. This is called the Coyote Valley. This is actually in the city limits of, of San Jose, but it's outside of San Jose's urban growth boundary. And they said, well, when we need the land, we'll include it in the urban growth boundary. So they told developers that if you'll do the environmental assessments, we'll add it to the urban growth boundary. So developers spent $15 million writing the environmental assessments. And the, uh, the Sierra Club said, the only way we're going to allow you to develop that land is if you give us $100 million to buy land somewhere else and make sure that land never gets developed. So the developers just said, forget it, and they walked away after spending $15 million. So as a result, the land prices are higher in California. This compares San Jose versus Dallas. The lot size prices are much higher in California, but the cost of getting a permit is much higher because the chances are you'll invest a lot of money trying to get permits and you'll never get them. Labor costs are higher simply because housing costs are higher and it costs more to, to pay laborers, although most of the laborers in San Jose probably live 90 miles away in the Central Valley where the best farmland in the United States is being developed for housing because uh, that's the only place where people can afford to live. Uh, as of 2006, about a dozen states had growth management laws. And with the exception of Tennessee, these are the states that had the severest housing bubbles. Uh, you can see I, I put uh, Missoula in red here, uh, but I probably should have put Bozeman in red as well. Uh, but uh, if you look at where there were housing bubbles, every state that had, a that had a growth management law had a housing bubble except for Tennessee. Every state that had a housing bubble except for Nevada had a growth management law. Nevada was special because 90% of the land in Nevada is federal, and uh, uh, the only way that developers could uh, build new properties in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas and Reno was to buy land from the federal government. Well, in 1999, the Congress, in its infinite wisdom, passed a law that said that 80% of the money you got from selling federal land had to be used to buy private land and take it out of the, the development base. So you end up, ended up having to buy several acres of land just to get one land, one acre net to build new housing on. So essentially, they had growth management at the federal level in Nevada. Back in it, although it's hard to believe today when we know that housing is really expensive in California and places like that, 
back in 1969, housing was pretty much affordable everywhere in the country except for Hawaii. Hawaii passed its growth management law in 1961. But outside of Hawaii, you could buy a house, a median home for twice median family incomes just about anywhere in the country. Now, being able to buy a home for twice median family income meant that a median family could pay off their house in less than 10 years. By 2006, in many parts of California, a house would cost close to 10 times. A median house would cost close to 10 times median family income. Uh, and still, in Houston, in Atlanta, and Dallas, houses were around twice median family incomes. So the growth management planning made housing more expensive. We look at uh, Montana, and we see Gallatin County, Bozeman has seen a, a run-up in prices, Flathead County has seen a run-up in prices, and Missoula County, uh, but you look at Cascade County, Yellowstone County, uh, they're still pretty affordable. In fact, most counties are pretty affordable in Montana. It's just those two or three communities that have tried to do smart growth on their own without, a, without the benefit of the state, uh, state law. Now, I'm not the only one who says this. There's an economist at, the, at Harvard University named Edward Glazer. Uh, there's economic analyses by a, a number of other economists, including somebody named Theo Eicher, who's from uh, University of Washington. And they all say that this kind of land use regulation has made housing prices more volatile. It's what led to the housing bubble. If you go back in time, California started this planning in the early 1970s. They've had three housing bubbles since then, uh, and yet uh, we see no housing bubbles, virtually no housing bubbles in places that don't do this kind of planning. So basically, the states enacted growth management laws at various times. Housing prices started rising in the 1990s. Uh, that led to pressure through the Community Reinvestment Act and things like that to force Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to uh, reduce loan requirements, have zero down payment loans and things like that. Uh, in 2001, there was a dot-com crash. Uh, you, you remember that. That led to a, a bit of a panic. But then uh, people who had put their money in the stock market decided to put their money into uh, housing instead. And we saw all this speculative housing uh, demand for housing, people flipping houses and things like that, until about 2006 when uh, inevitably the bubble began to deflate. Normally in a normal housing market you'll see prices waver up and down 10 percent or so. Basically prices are pr pr proportional to incomes and only if incomes fall because of a recession or something like that are, gonna pr are prices going to fall. So if you're a smart lender, you'll require that people put down 10 or 20 percent down on their house so they'll always be above water. They'll always have some equity in their homes and they won't want to walk away. So at the same time that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were reducing the down payment requirements to at first 5 percent and then 3 percent and eventually 0 percent, we saw the volatility increase so that prices in many places were fluctuating up and down 50 percent, not just 5 or 10 percent. So they should have been increasing the down payment requirements, not reducing them. Most of the foreclosures are due to people whose homes are underwater, homes whose prices have fallen by so much that they have no equity in the home, and so they say, well, why should we pay off a house that's worth less than we're paying? And I'll just walk away. The, unfortunately, our uh, wonderful leaders, uh, including the former Republican congressman, who's now our Secretary of Transportation, can't see this, and he's trying to get this imposed nationwide, although it's part of a transportation plan. The whole idea is you force people to live in high densities. Maybe they'll drive a tiny bit less. There's really no evidence that that's true, uh, but that basically is what the Obama administration is all about. As uh, President Obama himself says, he finds the suburbs boring, so if he can force everybody to, who lives in the suburbs to live in a high-density community, he thinks they'll be better off. Instead of doing this, we should try to protect property rights. Uh, we can protect people's ho home values in various ways. In Houston, there, are no, there is no zoning, but instead, most neighborhoods have protective covenants. And they have homeowner associations that uh, uh, 
uh, governed hideout covenants are managed. And in fact, if you live in a neighborhood that does not have covenants, you can form a homeowner association with your neighbors and through a majority process, a democratic process, write your own protective covenants. So you get to have some say in what, what your immediate neighbor does, but when you get a mile away, two miles away, you have no say. Uh, that's up to the property owners and, if, and, uh, and uh, homeowners if they're uh, together. Now, I've written a number of papers on this. The most recent one is called How Urban Planners Caused a Housing Bubble. Uh, I've also got a book called The Best Laid Plans. It talks about public land planning, private land planning, and transportation planning. I brought a, a few copies with me. I, unfortunately, I, I'm not uh, able to give every, one to everybody, but uh, it's a $23 book, and I can sell them for $15. Uh, I also have a blog that you might want to look at from time to time. It's called The Anti-Planner. I'm the Anti-Planner, and if you Google Anti-Planner, I'll be the first thing on the list. Uh, you can go to Cato.org to download my papers. Go to TI.org for The Anti-Planner. AmericanDreamCoalition.org also has some papers I've written on this subject. Uh, my email is rot at TI.org. And if you're interested, I, I can put you on my email list. I email out about once a month to a list of people talking about land use and transportation issues, uh, and I'll be glad to add you to the list. I guess in, in some, I would say the most important thing is to limit the ability of counties to zone land. When I would like to see cities switch from zoning to protective covenant, covenants and homeowner associations, but really, if, if zone, cities cannot do much damage if they zone if the counties don't have the right to zone. So if you can make sure the counties don't have the right to zone, then the cities zoning will be responsive to what people want instead of responsive to what planners think they ought to want. Do we have time for any questions? We've got time for one or two short but very important questions. Not to put anybody on the spot, but it's not short and very important. That's just the way it is. <laughs> Here we go. Just a comment. I'm sitting at the uh, Montana Building Industry Association table, and absolutely everything you said is accurate. <laughs> it's your galts at the other end of the room. <laughs> I just am curious, um, one way that some of that restrictions happens is through access control and the transportation policy and I know that that was starting to uh, rear its ugly head when you built a highway project you know 10 years ago I'm just wondering under the new administration if you're seeing more access control when you do highway pro policies as part of the federal package well, you know access control is an interesting thing if you if you're a highway owner you want to be able to get move people quickly on your road. And if you put too many driveways in, you have to slow down the uh, speeds. And I see, you know, I go to new shopping areas and the access is very limited. You know, how do you get in? How do you get to that store? How do you get out once you're in? It's a little annoying, but I don't see that as being a fundamental problem. What I see is the the, uh, the Obama administration wants to say not that you can limit access, but that those developments cannot be just a Walmart. You're going to have to build three stories of apartments above the Walmarts and Safeways and Kroger's. You're going to have to build, uh, when you build an Ikea, you're going to have to put out 2,000 uh, uh, um, 2, bike pet racks so that people can bicycle away with their 400 pounds of particle board furniture. And, you know, those of you from Missoula know that uh, Eagle Hardware wanted to build a hardware store, and they were told we had to put in 50 bike racks or something, and I think they gave up and decided they didn't want to do it. Uh, but, you know, this, these are serious proposals, and they're serious mandates, and basically, uh, when they just come from the state or local level, at least we can go to other states that don't have them and say, look, it's working just fine here, and, and these states are growing faster. Uh, but when it comes from the federal level and every city is going to have to do it. Uh, if you think the last housing bubble was bad, just wait until all 50 states have a housing bubble instead of just a dozen or so. One more. When you had mentioned smart growth, is this actually from the 
from the UN plan, that, which is Agenda 21? Agenda 21. Well, it's more like the other way around. Agenda 21 was written by American and European planners who sincerely believe that automobile driving is evil and people should live in high densities. And so they wrote it as Agenda 21, but you can trace these ideas back to at least the early 1970s. Uh, in 1972, a book was written called The Compact City uh, by American planners. Uh, so they've been promoting these ideas for a long time. I tell people, don't bring up Agenda 21 because it reduces your credibility. Uh, you talk about the United Nations, I don't know any local government official who thinks the United Nations is controlling what they do. So when you tell them the United Nations is forcing you to do this, then they just gonna, are just going to dismiss you. What's really happening is we have given this voodoo profession the right to manage almost every city and most counties in the country. Almost every city and most counties have urban planners on their staffs. When you really sit down and look at the urban planning uh, profession, they have no idea what they're doing. They don't know how cities work. They don't know how to make cities grow. And so they follow fads. And smart growth is the current fad. It used to be called new urbanism. And before that, it was called neo-traditionalism. Somebody, uh, the governor of Maryland in 1996, hit upon the term smart growth. And that swept across the country because they discovered anybody like me, they could just dismiss by saying, oh, O'Toole's in favor of dumb growth. We're in favor of smart growth. So which side do you want to be on? You want to be smart or you want to be dumb? And they actually admitted this after that governor left office. One of the staff members said that the only value of the term smart growth is we could accuse everybody else of being dumb. I looked up smart in the dictionary, by the way. Turns out the original definition is not wise or intelligent. It's a sharp, stinging pain. <laughs> so the opposite of smart growth... The opposite of smart growth, the growth that I think you want to have, is painless growth. Thank you very much. Thanks, Randall. All right, pay no, pay, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain as we do a little technology switch here. But uh, our next speaker is going to be Michael Tanner. Michael's a senior fellow, I believe, with Cato Institute. Uh, he specializes in health care reform, social welfare policy, uh, social security. Uh, you've probably